So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as, as the chairman said, I'll be talking about low, low carbon dairy farming. And by way of background, uh, it goes back to this publication in, um, published in 2012 in the Journal of Dairy Science, which was concerned with um, the carbon footprint of pasture-based dairy production can white clover make a difference. And it's based on um, work that we have been doing since 2000. We were, we've been comparing different systems in Salahed, uh, fertilizer nitrogen-based systems, uh, clover-based systems, different levels of intensity. Um, and, and, and we had nine years data together from between 2000 and 2009. And in this, in this Department of Agriculture funded project, then we started in 2008. We brought all that data together in the project and looked at what impact that had on, on the carbon footprint. And what we found that the clover-based systems had 16% lower carbon footprint than the, than the uh, fertilizer nitrogen-based systems. At the same time, and, and as part of another, a, a, a different project, we, we looked at the same dairy systems. And in this case, we compared the economic comparison of the dairy systems. And this was published in 2012 in, in Grass and Forage Science. What we found in that there was no difference in profitability between the systems, between the high nitrogen systems and the clover-based systems. And what we conclude from these two parts of work that was that uh, we can substantially reduce the carbon footprint of the milk production without impacting on profitability. As part of that project, we also look at the, at, at the, the science underpinning that, and we have a couple of publications on that as well. Well, we have a number, many more, but these are two that I'm highlighting here. And again, the, the, the outcome from that or the key message is that there was negligible nitrous oxide emissions associated with biological nitrogen fixation. So you could well ask, like, why, why, why am I getting all heavy here with showing all these papers? And really what I'm trying to do, and, and, and this is the end of it now, what I'm trying to do is to show that there's very strong science underpinning the message here, that, that we can reduce emissions and we, we can show how, we, how it can be done. And that that reflect as well with the, the current work we're doing, which is following on from that. So looking at this in a very simple way, if we take, say, white clover, grows in the, in the soil, there's nodules on the roots of white clover, there's bacteria live in those roots, which take atmospheric nitrogen and con convert it into a form that's available for plants. All this process takes place beneath the ground. And because of that, there's no nitrous oxide emissions. And as has been explained in earlier, uh, presentations in this series. Nitrous oxide is a very important greenhouse gas. Now if we look at the alternative which is a fertilizer or nitrogen based system, every time you apply fertilizer nitrogen you might apply it seven, eight, nine times per year. There's a pulse of nitrous oxide released after every application. And this can make a substantial contribution to um, the greenhouse gases emissions from a farm. And this is well supported as well by, by international research. So we've recently started a project now, and the title of that, the Department of Agriculture Funded Project, is Lowering the Carbon and Ammonia Footprints of Pasture-Based Milk Production. And the target we've set ourselves in, that is a 50% reduction in the carbon footprint of milk relative to uh, the national average, which is around 0.6 of a kilo of, of carbon dioxide equivalents per litre of milk. And just to clarify, and I know it has been explained in, in, in other presentations that the main greenhouse gases are methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. Ammonia is also, it's not a greenhouse gas, but it is a transboundary gas. And there are regulations governing it, so I, 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 I'll be speaking about that as well. Um, so if we look at it from a dairy systems point of view, where, where, where are these emissions coming from? And the main, the core component of our dairy system is the, the dairy herd. Obviously, the, we need the cows to produce milk. And then you have replacement heifers that are needed to maintain the, the dairy herd over time. And cows eat grass, concentrates, silage, and in the process of ruminant digestion, they release methane. Some of that is coming from the replacements. And that methane accounts for around 50% of all the emissions coming off uh, dairy farm, all the greenhouse gas emissions. So what can we do to lower it from a assistance point of view? We can increase the lifetime milk production per cow, which will help to lower emissions, and also we can lower replacement rate. And both of those things are the main drivers or key drivers of the EBI, and, and there's been some sub substantial progress in that over, over the last number of years. 
where you have cows, you've got like, excreta, they, they produce dung and urine, they produce slurry, and uh, we can't have cows without, without their excreta. And again, that accounts for around 20% of uh, nitrous oxide emissions from a farm symbolized here by, by this dung pad. So what can we do to lower um, nitrous oxide emissions or the ammonia emissions that come from this? And we can look at techniques like low emission slurry spreading and also increasing delinquent grazing season. Now both of these techniques will, will mainly lower ammonia more than nitrous oxide or greenhouse gases per se. And the big advantage of say using a trailing shoe for example for slurry application and, and uh, Dave Wall talked about this previously isn't so much the direct nitrous oxide reduction in nitrous oxide emissions, but the fact that we can, where we're using slurry more efficiently, we can cut back in the amount of fertilizer that we're using, and that will give us a reduction. And I'll, I'll explain more about that in time. The other big component then is the fertilizer nitrogen that we apply. And again, with the type of system we're talking about, high nitrogen system, around 20% of the emissions coming from a farm are in the form of uh, nitrous oxide. So that accounts for about 90% of the emissions. The other emissions then, um, smaller amount of carbon dioxide from uh, driving tractors and, and similar type of activities on the farm. The things we can do to lower emissions from fertilizer is to replace, say, can, for example, with protected urea, and Patrick Forrest will talk about this last week, and also maybe making use of uh, clover in the system, red and white clover, and, I, and I've pointed this out already or highlighted the background to this. The last component of the system then is soil sequestration and the capacity of the soil to take carbon out of the atmosphere. We've been measuring soil, uh, carbon and soil ahead for the last 20 years, and I'll, I'll say something about that. But really, if we take our overall system here and if we draw a line down between it, it breaks down into two main parts as I see it. One is on this side, on the left hand side, you have uh, the numbers. Essentially, all the emissions here are associated with livestock numbers, more cows, more replacements, and a few cows and replacements, they produce slurry. And, and it's a numbers game at this side of the line. The other one then is uh, the nitrogen. And if you're to target cutting emissions, and then what I'll be primarily talking about today is, is, is looking at, at this side of it, at the nitrogen side, because ultimately, we need cows. We need cows to produce milk. If we don't have cows, we're not producing milk. We can't really do without the cows, uh, but nitrogen, there, there are things that we can work on in terms of cutting emissions on this side of the line. So if you go on then to talk about systems analysis, and the first system that I talk about here is a kind of a standard system that most people will be familiar with. It is based on the old Moore Park blueprint, two and a half livestock units per hectare stocking rate, 200, 280 kilos of nitrogen per hectare uh, using uh, cannon urea and splash blade slurry application. Most people will be familiar with this, with this uh, type of a system. I'll just point out here that when we look at the big emissions from the farm, you can see that the real, the big three are methane, excreta, here, as we talked about, and fertilizer nitrogen. And if we look at, at, at these two, excreta and methane, these 67% of the emissions are livestock related. They're related purely to numbers. And there's very little we can do about that as things stand. Uh, Donald Pat or Joe Patton talked uh, a few weeks ago about um, the silver bullet, bullet to lower methane emissions. That's, that's something that's, that's, that's being researched. And that's something that could be very important, of course, because the alternative is a, is a lead bullet and we start uh, cutting livestock numbers and really that, that would undermine our capacity to, to produce food. Uh, but I'm going to focus here at this end of it on, on the nitrogen fertilizer end, as I said. This is where we'll be doing most of the work. So the, the next system that we look at here is if we take, replace the cannon urea with protected urea and low, low emission slurry spreading, take out the, in this case, a band spreading as opposed to splash plate. Same stock rate, two and a half livestock units per hectare. We've lowered the fertilizer nitrogen to 250 kilos per hectare only using protected urea right across the year, no other fertilizer nitrogen. So we cut the nitrogen fertilizer rate in line with making more efficient use of slurry, which is technically possible. And this type of system is very easy to run, works fine. We've run it now for a number of years in Salahed. So essentially it's, it's only using protected urea and uh, band spreading. And this will give us around 9% lower emissions. Uh, 
half of those emissions coming from using protected urea instead of can, and the other half coming from the lower nitrogen fertilizer use associated with uh, low emission slurry spreading. And this is a system that's very simple, very easy for farmers to adopt uh, straight away. If we, if we looked at it from a national point of view, if all the nitrogen fertilizer that we use, all the can type fertilizer was, was replaced by protected jury, we cut national emissions from agriculture by around 3%. There's much more scope for cutting emissions on dairy farms than there are on say beef farms or, or tillage farms, for example. Dairy farms account for around half of uh, national emissions from agriculture. The next system then that we look at is where we introduce clover into the system. And this goes back to the systems that we've been using, say, in solid since around uh, 2004. Two and a half livestock units per hectare. Cutting the fertilizer used 125, only protected urea, band spreading slurry application, and, and using clover. So we're using protected urea clover here to replace fertilizer nitrogen and uh, low emission slurry spreading. And that gives us um, around 18% uh, lower emissions. So substantial emissions, similar to the, the starting um, point that I talked about. It still doesn't really get us down to the target that we, we set for ourselves. And when we look at this scenario, this is when we look at it and say, well, what else can we cut? There's only one real area left, and that's, that's this area here, the fertilizer. So we're looking at this system. Um, we've, we've run the system last year. We're, we're, we're trialing it again this year, and I think that's the big challenge. As, as Professor Boyle said at the beginning of, of the series, we can do a lot of things on spreadsheets. We really need to do it on the ground, and we've been testing this system, um, only clover-based system with low emission slurry spreading. And in this case, we get 26% lower emissions. And you could well ask the question, why, why are we going to this very extreme type of a system? Is, is it realistic? And I suppose the justification I would say to that is if, if you look at... Um, the national situation, there's a target to cut emissions from agriculture by 10 to 15%. Um, as things stand, emissions from agriculture are increasing. It's mainly driven by uh, dairy expansion, as, as, as we know. And like, the question will come sooner or later is, um, how are we going to cut these emissions and how will, how will they be cut? And, and who, who will take the cut? Is it going to be the low stock dairy, bee farmer that has um, some forestry and is almost, already operating an almost carbon neutral system? Will it be a dairy farmer that um, had 70 cows and would now increase to, has, has increased to 80 cows or 85 cows? Or is it a dairy farmer that, that uh, had 70 cows pre quota and now has gone up to 350 cows? And, and th these are really big questions. And um, I suppose we, we, it's up to people like me to look at solutions. The other, the other aspect to this is if we go back, say, pre quota, there was a million dairy cows in the country. We now have uh, 1.5 million dairy cows. What's going to happen in the future? Are we going to go up to 2 million dairy cows in another five years, or maybe 2.5 million dairy cows by 2030? And are such, a thing, are such things possible? It might, it might sound uh, un, unreasonable or unrealistic, but, but the possibilities exist, and, and they're worth examining. And that's part of what we're going to look at in this new project that I'm talk, talking about. Um, and uh, Dr. David Stiles in University of Limerick is leading a task to look at this question. And it mightn't be as, as unrealistic as, as it might sound. And really what it will entail will be really looking at how far we can cut emissions on farms and what we can do in that regard. So that's really where I'm coming from. From a technical point of view, there's also the challenge of, of running this system. And really when you're down to having clover and having no fertilizer nitrogen in the system, it really focuses the mind on really making best use of the resources that you have available to you in terms of say maximizing fixation by clover how to manage the clover to maximize that and also the making best use of your slurry particularly getting it out early in the spring boost the spring growth so that's the basis for that now what i've been showing here so far is is in terms of uh, emissions per hectare in tons uh, switching over here now to talk about emissions per litre of milk, it's, it's more or less the same. And this low input system here gets us down to 0.7 of a kilo of carbon dioxide per litre of milk, which is still not down to the target of 0.6 that we've set for ourselves. There are things that we can do around that, and I'll say more about that in a minute. The other thing about these four systems are the ammonia emissions associated with them. 
the standard here is kind of the old Moorcraft blueprint, protected jury and low emission slurry spreading. Protected jury is slurry spreading in clover that, that I talked about in the zero nitrogen fertilizer system with low emission slurry spreading in clover. And you can see particularly this one gives, gives us a very rapid drop in the ammonia emissions. So potentially dropping it between 20 and 34% using these different systems, actually having a bigger impact on ammonia emissions than on the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is the primary focus of, the, of this work. If we go back to this system here, this clover-based system, as I said, it's, it's been well established, not only in Salahed, we've run it for a number of years, also it's been run in Moor Park and also now in Clannacilty and works fine. And uh, technically, can support the stocking rate and economically it stacks up. And there's, there's evidence to show that. What we're looking at with this system, I suppose the system that can be adopted pretty straight away is, is the system two with the low emission slurry spreading protected urea. The clover is, a, is maybe the next step down the line. Um, that'll get us down to emissions of 0.78 of a kilo of carbon dioxide, which is 30%, 35% lower than the national emissions. And just to make some comments around that, even our control system in Salahed like, is very efficient. We're working at a very high level of technical uh, efficiency in terms of we've everything running right in terms of soil lime status, B&K, very high EBI herd. At the present time, we're producing uh, 17,500 litres of milk or 14,000 or 1,400 kilos of milk solids off the milking platform, stock to three cows per hectare. The overall farm stocking rate is uh, 2.5. So we're bringing in silage from off the platform and also a contract rearing out the heifers. But when it comes to the to uh, looking at the emissions, we, in, we include all the emissions from all, all different parts of the system, including the contract reared heifers. And as, as I said, our emissions per litre of milk are down at 0.78 a kilo of carbon dioxide. This is 35% lower than the national emission, national average, as I said already. But really just to emphasize the point that if the number of dairy cows and dairy livestock has gone up by 50%. If we were to look at a cut across all dairy farms of 35%, that would bring us back down to pre-quota levels in terms of emissions from dairy, dairy farms. And, and that's the significance of that figure. In terms of the economics, as they've shown already, no difference in profitability in, in work that we did previously, older work now. There's new work in Clannock Hilti showed that the clover-based systems were more profitable. That's from Clannock Hilti. It's also work from Moor Park, and they've been running this type of system for a good number of years now in Moor Park. And again, without having the, the final analysis, but it's clear when you look at the data that, that the system is, is, is very competitive economically. So we're safe to draw the conclusion that the clover-based system that I'm talking about with 100 to 150 kilos per hectare of protected urea can at least be as profitable as a high fertilizer nitrogen input system. That's a very conservative statement. And I think it's, it's one of the fundamental problems with, with clover-based systems in that they're similar in terms of profitability. There's no massive incentive then uh, to, to convert the clover. And as, as I said, there, there are some obstacles to, to it. Other aspects that we can look at, um, I think when we do the final analysis again in a few years' time, when we're collecting the data, we may need to consider looking at carbon footprint per euro of income rather than per hectare or per litre. And that would give us some flexibility uh, around uh, the economics of uh, the stocking rates and the different systems. Because on a farm like Salahed, a 50 hectare farm, you'll spend uh, 14, 15,000 on nitrogen fertilizer. You can have that by adopting a clover system, cut that back to around 7,000 euro. And even as you, as you go lower, there, there, there are savings there that can be made that can be offset against the uh, output. And, uh, and I think we'll have to, that will give us more flexibility, some flexibility then in terms of uh, cutting our emissions. We look at the EBI in Salahed, we've seen small incremental changes over the last 20 years uh, that, that accumulate over time. And, and as has been shown by Gary Lanigan earlier on, has, been, has potentially a big impact um, on a national level. Soil sequestration, we've been measuring uh, soil carbon levels in Salahed over the last 20 years. We see reseeding as a, an important component of the system in terms of maintaining the clover contents and productive clover swarts. And when we reseed, we're releasing a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. We, re, re, we regain that back within a 10-year ten, ten time frame. So we're, we're, we're content to say that uh, 
the system we're running in terms of receding is, is carbon neutral within that 10 year time frame. <clears throat> We've looked at land drainage, and again, it's a way of increasing the productivity of our clover swards. And this is another recently completed uh, Department of Agriculture from the project. And the, the conclusion is that is that it's giving us uh, lower nitrous oxide emissions. So drainage will actually lower the emissions, maybe against what we kind of might have initially expected. This year, for the first time, we're using sex semen. This won't really have much of an impact on the emissions from solid head per se, but will improve uh, the downstream quality of the lives of the cows being sold off the farms in terms of beef production. If, if there's more beef type breeds being used rather than, than black and whites. We've also planted hedgerows. We've had a number of reasons for this. To increase shelter, biodiversity, have a very small impact really on um, the carbon balance of the farm, but, but it's something that we can also take into account. In terms of the implications of this work, um, converting over to clover isn't as easy as it might sound. It's, it's probably a four year process. We have a lot of experience of this now with Solihead and, and, and out with farmers that it's not, not as easy. There are obstacles. Also, when you're changing the sward species competition, you need to change the grassland management and there's been very sophisticated grassland management um, support systems or decision supports been developed in Moore Park over the last 20 years and, and changing from that is not without its problems. The other thing I'd say at Solihead, we have, we have run high stock systems with very low environmental footprints. And, and when we go back to the original work, which was focused on the, say the REP scheme back in the early 2000s, where the limit on stocking rate was, was two cows per hectare. And we started running clover-based systems to fit within that. And we very rapidly found that we, we, we were growing far more grass than we could utilize with that type of stocking rate of two cows per hectare. And we had to increase the stocking rate. And we've been increasing the stocking rate and increasing the, the, the management or management skills our knowledge of, of how to optimize clover use. And we're operating now at, at much higher stocking rates. And of course, when you think of the Paris Agreement, the objective there is to cut, cut greenhouse gas emissions across Europe, across the world. But a clause within that is also this idea of maintaining global food production in light of growing global demand for food with growing global population and this idea of sustainable intensification. And I think the type of systems that we're talking about here fit well within that, 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 that idea. And then that brings you on to the question of derogation and that has come up as part of the series as well, where if there's some talk of say, removing the derogation, which would set a limit of uh, two livestock units per hectare, even for the very low input systems, very low environmental impact systems that we're running at Solihead, that doesn't really give us any great benefit. It's only putting in an additional cost on farmers. And I really question if, uh, limiting stock rate is the right way to go in the context of, of what, I, what I've just said here in terms of cutting greenhouse gas emissions, cutting ammonia emissions, and also in terms of uh, the impact on water quality. And we've long-term data sets on, on water quality at Solhead, uh, on nitrate levels and on phosphorus loss. Another aspect of this work is, um, is the marketing opportunities that can go with low carbon footprint milk. If we, if we take that we can, without too much difficulty, get down to a uh, carbon footprint of 0.78 of a kilo of, of carbon dioxide per, per litre of milk. That's a very low uh, level of emission internationally, particularly if, if we take a global approach to, to, to um, look at our emissions. And if, if you were a, an international company like, say, Nestle or, or Danone that were wanted to manufacture a product with a low carbon footprint, and consumers are increasingly aware of, the, of, the, of these questions, and if you have the option as that international company of taking milk from the Netherlands, taking milk from Germany with a, which, which, with a higher carbon footprint or taking Irish milk, you can see that this creates a, a competitive opportunity for us in Ireland if we can uh, roll this out. And then this brings us on, the same question brings us on to the question of organic production. Um, very small level of production in Ireland. If we look at the systems we're running in Salahed, we're, we're not a million miles away from, from you know, zero nitrogen input system. And you can see here, this, this picture here, crossbred cow out of high EBI bulls, grazing a grassland. And the difference in this picture is that the, you can hardly see it, but the Baltic Sea is there in the background. And this is a, a project we're running with the University of Kiel, where they've set up a 
pasture-based system, similar to the type of systems we're running in Salahed. We've been running it now for a number of years, and it's, it's working very well. Uh, uh, an organic base, it's an organic system, and um, they're getting an average milk price of uh, 50 cent per litre. A very competitive system. Works well for them. In terms of conclusions to this work, uh, if we talk about protected jury and less, using that to replace fertilizer nitrogen standard approach and replacing and, and splash plate. This type of system could be very easily adopted today, it will give us a 9% reduction in emissions. That really won't get us down nationally to the targets, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. Clover will get us further, but there are larger obstacles to adopting clover-based systems. There's a conversion process that will have to be taken, undertaken. Clover-based systems are economically competitive, so there's no real problem from that point of view. As we all know, there's a growing demand for food and the need for sustainable intensification. I think the systems I'm talking about fit well within that, that, that idea. And finally, I think when we, there, there are some upsides to this in terms of, say, marketing opportunities. If we can develop, say, milk with a, a much lower carbon footprint and ammonia footprint. So that's, that's my presentation. I just, as a final point, I just want to acknowledge uh, different people who've worked on this over the last 10 years, particularly highlighting a uh, farm manager in Solid, Solihead, Daniel Barrett, and, and the team at Solihead, and also the people who've gained PhDs as part of this work over the last 10 years, um, many of whom, whom now have gone on to uh, uh, very successful careers. So thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation and a, a good reminder, I suppose, you know, the, heart, the, the work that you've been doing and the, what you're presenting here isn't a, a year's work. It's, it's a culmination of 10 years of, of work. I mean, to the skeptics out there, James, who would say, well, that's all fine in a research environment. What would you say in terms of putting this into practice at a farm level? I know you, you we, we, we spoke earlier about the, the challenges about incorporating clover into dairy systems. Um, you know, are, what are the practical measures that can, can uh, take place and, uh, uh, to support the rollout of something, these types of systems? Um, th that's where the real obstacle lies. And as I was saying in the presentation, um, Part of the problem is when we, when we do the economics of a clover-based system compared to the alternative, the, there are, you could argue that there are advantages, economic advantages, but are those advantages strong enough to, are they strong enough incentive to, to go over to this type of system? And there is a learning curve involved as well in terms of knowledge transfer, uh, how to manage these wards optimally. And if you think about the, uh, the fundamentals of conversion, as I said, it could be a four-year process. And during that time on a dairy farm, you may end up receiving some of your swords, having clover, other swords, no clover. A big risk there is if you're moving dairy cows from one system to another, it's a risk associated with bloat. Now, the, we've never actually lost a cow in solid head with bloat. We've lost cows for other reasons like milk fever and, and uh, grass tetany, but the system we run, we keep the cows on clover the entire year. And in that way, the cows adapt to the clover and there's no real problem. And that, that is one of the obstacles, if you think about it in terms of conversion, how do you manage a dairy farm where you have some parts of the farm under clover in the first years, other parts of the farm without clover. And then there's a, a process that you go undergo over a number of years. And of course, there's a cost associated with it associated with that as well in terms of reseeding if you intensify the level of reseeding during the conversion process. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks James. Uh, Pat, um, I see lots of really good questions coming yeah. through there. Do you want to talk us through, uh, put some of those to James? Yeah, I suppose the, the, the first one I was looking at uh, relates to the soil type. Um, solid head is a, is a heavy soil. Uh, is there any impact on, on, on different soil types? And there was a second part to that, that, that question, uh, looked at the persistency issue. Uh, are you maintaining the, uh, the clover in the sward and how are you doing that? The first thing in terms of soil type, in general, the lighter the soil, the better the clover, the heavier the soil, more difficulties. Um, 
on the other hand, the lighter the soil, the lower the background release in nitrogen, and the heavier soil, you get more background release. And there, there is a trade-off there between clover, background release in nitrogen, and fertilizer nitrogen use. Soil ahead is a relatively heavy soil. It's a difficult soil, more difficult to manage for clover than, than say, some other soils like Moor Park, for example. But we've managed to maintain the clover there without any great problem maintain productive clover swards and that's something that we're focused on like the key as we see it right now we need to reseed every 10 years and we built that into our system and that's part of what we're looking at in terms of this carbon neutral reseeding uh, we oversaw um, management is key in terms of uh, low post grazing heights how you manage the clover at different times of the year uh, what we found in recent years there is that uh, tight grazing before the winter, which kind of conflicts with, with current recommendations in terms of really skinning out the swards before going into the winter, has a big impact in the following year. And we've also, in Solihead, looked at uh, land drainage, spending a small amount of money every year on, on improving our drainage, and, and we think that's having a positive impact. I think technically there's no great problem with maintaining clover on a lot of different soil types in Ireland. Of course, we need to have more experience of different soil types and that will only come with time. Um, I think the, the, the key is, is, is getting that out onto farms and, and getting that to work for farmers, which, which I, I have worked on in the past and it's not as easy. It's, it's not easy. There's, there, there is a challenge there. There's no doubt about it. Um. And just, in, uh, I suppose, in relation to early season, the question there in relation to early season grazing, particularly with the, the low, uh, the zero nitrogen, how do you manage that in terms of getting that early grass or have you adjusted calving rates or calving dates to, to, to adapt? In, uh, we, or to develop we've that? considered ad adjusting calving dates. Uh, we haven't. And there's a long story behind that, but, but, but we haven't. Uh, in terms of getting early grass with the zero nitrogen system, it's a case of just making use of your slurry, getting out. We, we apply the slurry with a band spreader on an umbilical system, so even if the soils are wet, we can we can get out and uh, and and get the slurry on, and that, that's a key part of it across all the farm. And, I, and this is what I kind of mentioned during the presentation: when your back is to the wall and you you have to get to production, you have to get the cows out to grass. You have slurry there as a resource. It often goes badly managed or have forgotten about. Having to rely on it really focuses the mind. And I, that focus gives you really a very efficient system that can work. James, that works. But like we're testing it, so I won't say too much about that until we have a couple of more years under our belt. James, uh, we've, we're hearing from that New Zealand have announced uh, 190 kilograms per hectare limit on synthetic nitrogen uh, and, a, and a biodiversity strategy. Um, and here in Europe, then we have the farm to fork, which is calling for a 20% reduction in fertilizer use. Uh, question here is, should we, set, should we be setting a, a 2025 as a target for Ireland to achieve this or be more ambitious in the, the limits that we're applying uh, to, to the use of chemical nitrogen uh, at a farm level. I mean, it's, it, it is a controversial one, but um, very relevant, I suppose, in the context of the, the nitrate der derogation and in Ireland. I think that, that, that's really a, qu a question for policymakers and, and, and for shareholders and, 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 and how they see what's the future vision. I think it's, it's up to people like me to test these systems and, and say whether or not they can work. And, mm -hmm. Like it, within the context of a research farm, it, it can work. You're clearly saying it can work and that you have shown that there is a negligible impact on, on profitability. Is that true to say? Yeah, and I think that's supported by work in Clinic Guilty, that recent paper, and also um, more back. There's, there's clear evidence from the, the work the other Hennessy in the system they've been running down there for the last number of years. When you look at the figures, they're clearly... They're clearly competitive economically. Just a quick question there. You mentioned about the, the drainage and the, the fact that that's actually lowering emissions. Uh, could you clarify how, 
how that is. Uh, just we have a question here: How does drainage lower emissions? Well, okay. So we 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 have a couple of papers on this recently. Um, so the first thing we looked at, we we tested different systems of drainage in Salahed. We looked at uh, what impact that had on nitrous oxide emissions. We looked at it in terms of carbon, soil carbon. So no change in soil carbon, which when we compare it to receding, of course we're putting in the drainage at a, a deeper depth. We looked at the it's as simple as this. When you look at nitrous oxide emissions from a soil, as a general rule, the wetter the soil, the more nitrous oxide that you get. It's this process of denitrification that people will be familiar with, where you have nitrate that gets broken down in the soil, particularly under wet anaerobic conditions. When you drain the soil, you release the water, you reduce the amount of wetness, and therefore you lower the amount of denitrification that's taking place. That's the simple explanation. So you get less nitrous oxide. The other thing that we found was by increasing, by improving drainage, we, we lowered uh, phosphorus loss as well, because there was less overland flow where we improved the drainage. So a win-win situation there. And again, like I, I think if we look at Salahed over 10, 15 years, 20 years, and look at the impact that we're having in terms of the, the system, like we're having very low environmental impact. We have a very low environmental impact system with, with, that's operating at a, at a high stocking rate. Like we have 135 cows on a 52 hectare platform. Okay. Pat, uh, over to you. Yeah, a couple of, couple of things. Uh, do, uh, do you see a role for red clover in, in your systems? Yeah, that's, that's something we're looking at in, in, in recent times and the type of mix, mixes we're using now at the moment. Uh, couple of perennial ryegrasses, late heading perennial ryegrasses, uh, combination of white clover, red clover, and uh, we're using hybrid clover as well. It's a hybrid between white clover and, and Caucasian clover. How we see the red clover fitting in, uh, we get an initial boost in terms of um, when we include it in the grass, grazing silage mix. So the, one of the problems with red clover is you, 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 you can't have it continuously. It doesn't last anyway, but mm. We put it in the grazing mix. It can give us a kick for two or three years. Then it starts to die out of the sward. White clover comes in, but it gives us a big jump in productivity in the early years. And like with red clover, you're talking about very high levels of nitrogen fixation, 300 kilos per hectare plus has been measured uh, in our work also. Work Dan Clavin has done up in Grange and, and uh, Johnston Castle. Um, the other place where red clover fits in is on the outside blocks mm. for silage. Yeah. in a three or four year mix with, uh, with hybrid ryegrass and very high levels of productions. 15, 16 tons of nitrogen of dry matter production per hectare with no nitrogen fertilizer input, just PK and, and uh, slurry. Very high levels of output. Uh, another question, uh, what would you uh, be the target level of clover that you have uh, being delivered in terms of, of grazing from the, the sward, in terms of contribution to diet? And well, you see, this was as well. the reality is uh, like, clover kind of reaches its own level. Like, we, we've been measured now with a lot of data. And on average, uh, it works out at around 20%. Now, the less nitrogen we use, the more we get on an annual basis. So we can, if we take out the nitrogen, as, as we've been talking about, that'll push our annual average up to 25%. Now, that'll vary between April when it's at its lowest, because clover goes through an annual cycle. Increases rapidly during the summer, it can go up to 50% of the sward, and then it tends to die out of the sward over the winter. And that's why management, grazing management around the winter is absolutely crucial in terms of maintaining clover. The less nitrogen fertilizer you use, the more clover that you'll have. And soil type will come into that as well. And like in soil ahead, we're more or less fixed within that band of 20 to 25% on an annual basis. If you have lighter soil, you probably get up to higher levels. Okay, a lot of questions about the, the potential role of, of multi-species swords. And I know, I'm not sure it's your area of expertise. I don't know if you've done any work in Salahed, but there is a bit of work around Chagas on it. But your view on the potential role? I think it, it fits in to some extent with what we're saying. It's a, it's a similar enough message because when you look at the multi-species swords, um, fixation is also a key component of that in terms of cutting the carbon footprint work in Johnson Castle, work in ECD would say the same thing. I'm not so sure 
personally about the, some of the other elements like the plantain and the, the chicory. I'm, there's a lot of work going on in that and I'd like to see how that, that, that pans out in terms of how you integrate that in terms of your grassland management. Like we'll still try to maintain uh, pre-grazing yields of 1400 for target grazing throughout the grazing season. We can do that very easily with this kind of grass, white clover, red clover system that I'm talking about. When you integrate more species, makes it maybe a bit trickier, I don't know. I, am, I know they're working at Curtins, they're working in Johnson Castle, they're working on an UCD, so be very interested to see how, how that all pans out. And so it's a li little bit of a wait and see on that one. A, a yeah. question that, and, and this is something I would have uh, uh, heard anecdotally, is there any issue with a release of nitrogen into, I suppose, potentially as a water quality issue in the back end of the year? Uh, or is that something that you have had a, an opportunity to look at? Well, we, as I said, we've a big data set on water quality in Salahed. And in terms of nitrates uh, with clover, um, ultimately, if you have a nitrogen system, you're putting nitrogen into the system. Cows eat the grass, you get urine, urine patches, and they're ma a major source of leaching, particularly on lighter soils. If you introduce clover to replace that nitrogen, you end up with exactly the same problems in terms of uh, potential losses. Now, we've measured it in Salahed, and Salahed is representative of a lot of the different, uh, around a quarter of the soils of Ireland. And uh, Gary Lanigan, a few on the Brendan, other people have been looking at, at, at the particular side that we have in Salahed, and basically, and it, it, I think it's, Salahed is like a big denitrification factory where any surplus nitrate that's there does get it gets denitrified down to uh, nitrogen gas. So we don't really have a problem in Salahed in that regard. Actually, very low levels of nitrate, both in wells and in the drains draining the farm. That's not to say that uh, clover will give us any great improvement in that regard on more vulnerable soils. Okay. And uh, I, I suppose there's a few questions there in relation to your met methods of, of introduction and maintaining uh, clover levels in the, the sward in terms of, of sowing and, and over sowing or what are you doing? Well, uh, I suppose when we started to work back years ago, we were using over sowing only as a low cost way. Uh, the kind of systems we're using at the moment, re reseeding is a key component of that and has to be a key component of it. We'd recommend reseeding on, on a 10 year basis. And within that, if you put in new sward, you're gonna get very high levels of production for the first three, four years, particularly if there's red clover in there, gives a big boost. Red clover start to die out over time. We then go in and over sow after five years, maintain the clover content, and then let that run then reseed after another five years. So we're on a 10 year cycle with regard to reseeding and over sowing on a five year basis within that, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of questions around methane, and I know that's not the focus of your uh, talk, and we did have a, a talk which focused on that, one of the previous ones, so if you want to go to go back. Uh, but maybe in insofar as you're having a, a target for a very high reduction in, in our greenhouse gas emissions, I presume methane at some point has to come into uh, the thinking in, in terms of how that's going to be achieved, if it's going to be achieved. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I said that in the talk, really, that would be a, a game changer to change everything and how, and, and how we look at this whole systems approach. Not to throw cold water on it, I suppose there has been a lot of research done on it uh, over the years and we're still waiting for a, a solution. Um, and, I, and I think we have to bear that in mind. But, but I think there's people better qualified to talk about methane than me. James, we have a question here in relation to the Chagas approach to uh, clover. Um, question here is, when will all Chagas farms be switching to clover and low end use? Uh, I suppose that's in the context of being a, a demonstration farms, I would imagine, rather than necessarily research farms. That, that's, that's happening as we speak. I think all, all of my understanding, all the Moor Park farms anyway, are, are going over to clover-based systems. Okay, very good. With, with low nitrogen fertilizer input. The question here, um, while good results were seen for emission intensity reduction, 
What was the impact on total farm emissions? Was stocking rate increased throughout the system? Uh, do you think there is a risk that if a farmer knows the emissions intensity is coming down by, say, using protected urea, it could lead to the farmer to thinking that they can increase their cow numbers? I think you did mention that your cow numbers you did increase at one stage in response. Well, okay, to so it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, on, on the one hand, like for a lot of the graphs I show there, the intensity per litre of milk and per hectare were the same level of reduction. We're talking percentages, 9%, 18%, 26%. That was the same because we have a fixed stocking rate. I, I also mentioned that if we were to look at, say, the profitability per hectare, um, that, w that we could look at it in terms of carbon footprint rather than emission per litre or per, per hectare. Um, so, like in the earlier work that we did, we said a 16% reduction in per litre of milk. There was actually a 24% reduction in uh, emissions per hectare. So the higher emissions per hectare, if, if you were operating a clover system, maybe it's not as productive, maybe you'd, you'd, you'd look at some of the flexibility around stocking rate. So there, 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 there is some potential there. And I suppose part of the motivation for this work is, is, is to look at the, what potential there is there for, for further expansion. Now, if you take sol ahead, we had 90 cows pre-quota. We've gone up to 135 cows. We were rearing the replacement heifers on the farm. They're now contract reared. So we've kind of outsourced that to another farm. If you look at that in terms of the total land footprint, including the contract rearing farm, our emission intensity hasn't changed greatly in that regard. Mm -hmm. More cows concentrated on the platform because there's more land coming into it in terms of the contract wearing. There's actually uh, no real change in our, in our emissions per litre or per hectare. I know I, 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 I didn't answer that very well, but. Oh, well, yeah. well, that's fair enough. Um, question in relation to, it says here, climate change is predicted to lead to drier summers. Currently, there is a soil moisture deficit in many parts of the country. Does clover enhance the sward's ability to cope with drier drought-like conditions? And we did have another question there in a similar vein about uh, the timing, or would, it, would you recommend sowing clover uh, at the back end of the year, um, or maybe the autumn, given the, the dry period that we're going through at the moment? So I suppose the first part of that question is... Um drought. Um, clover has a very shallow rooting system, uh, white clover, and in that regard it's, it's maybe a bit drought prone. However, clover, like clover is different to grass and how it grows. Like An easy way to imagine clover, it's a bit like if you ever see ivy growing up a wall, clover grows along the ground in the same way. So it has a lot of resources. It could be a couple of tons of uh, clover stolen on the surface of the ground or within the top few centimeters of the soil. And that gives that clover great resistance to drought conditions. So clover is, it's well adapted to coping with drought and to recovering after drought. Um, so yeah, we, we, we've had no great difficulty. Actually warm weather suits clover, dry soil conditions actually helps fixation. So if we could have things drier and moist rather than wet, clover will do better. And that's part of the reason, motivation for the drainage work that we've done. In terms of oversowing done, then obviously oversowing under these conditions is, uh, isn't going to be very successful at that present time because obviously seeds need moisture to germinate. Mm. Um, but we found in, in 06 and again in 2018 where we did oversow just plant the seed that the clover tended to come at the end of that dry period because we had all the swords skinned out at that stage and there's plenty of light getting down to the seed when, when the rain came. But it's, not, it, it's certainly not ideal for, for, for oversowing under these conditions. What about uh, planting in the autumn time as opposed to now? Well, there's another question, and I, I guess like, it's the whole question of reseeding and when you should reseed. On general principle, you should try to reseed earlier in the year because when you, when you reseed, when you cultivate, you do mineralize a lot of carbon, you mineralize a lot of nitrogen. The earlier you reseed in the year, the more likely you, you'll capture that nitrogen back in, in the growing crop. If you reseed in the autumn, 
you're then receding at a higher risk of time, a more riskier time in terms of uh, losses to water. Mm -hmm. So in, in, as a general rule, we'd, we'd recommend the spring. We tend to aim for the month of uh, May when we start running into a grass surplus on the farm solid, maybe April, May. Uh, but reseeding in the autumn is, is equally viable, except there is more risk in terms of uh, environmental impact. Um, just a question on in relation to sequestration and your experience with, with sequestration uh, into the soils over the, the period. Um, I, I think when, when you look at soil ahead, it's an intensively managed farm. Um, we're reseeding on a regular basis over the last 50 years. And in, the, in that type of scenario, like we, we lose carbon during reseeding. It's, it's just uh, when you cultivate, you oxygenate the soil, you get a lot of mineralization taking place, you lose carbon. Uh, what we found with our long-term measurements is that we can maintain our carbon levels in the soil and that we've exceptionally high soil carbon levels in soil aid, it has to be said, the type of soil that we have. But we can, we've maintained those levels in the long term, we're seeing no loss of carbon. So we lose some carbon during reseeding, but over the course of the following 10 years, we gain that carbon back. And uh, we have some nice data on that. Okay, and there's a question there about, uh, in, I suppose, in some of the very heavy soils and difficult to manage soils, and there may be some of the soils up in more northern part of the country with shorter growing season. Do you see any increased difficulty there, or is it just, I suppose, a little bit more care and, and, and work away? It's, it's like everything. Like, I think we're seeing... Uh, Expansion, expansion of dairy farming in the West. We've seen some excellent dairy farms in Connacht. There's no reason why they couldn't run this type of system as opposed to any other type of system. Um, it's all ahead. Is, is, is not, it's a difficult enough farm in that regard. So I guess time will tell. And I, I, as I said, I, I think there are obstacles there. And, and I think with really, if, if farmers were to take this on in, in a big way, that's, that's when you really start to find the solutions a much broader range of solutions than, than, than we can find with a very narrow focus on, on research farms. James, for farmers who want to incorporate more clover into their farms, can you recommend uh, some resources that they can go to to, uh, to guide them through that process? I know, of course, they need, we recommend talking to their, their child's advisor and there's lots of demonstrations happening at a local level, but in terms of internet resources or... Um, okay. Well, I, I suppose there's a fair amount of information on the, on the Chagas website. I think the, the Graston program have, be, have, a, have a recommendations around that. Um, I think, I think you'd, you'd, if you went looking for it, you'd find a, a fair amount of information. Okay, very good. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, just one question there, the, uh, the, uh, it's come in there a minute ago. Uh, have you looked at any other enriched crops such as Lucerne or Alpha Alpha and a potential role? Well, yeah, yeah, we've thought about it. We've been looking at research in New Zealand uh, where we're using Lucerne in the grazing situation. Um, we've thought about it, we probably haven't acted on it. I think we, we've taken a step with red clover, uh, but, but it's interesting. It could be worth looking at. Okay, uh, Mark, do you have anything more? Yeah, there's, there's um, a few questions there coming in about, you know, again, going back to the, um, the farm to fork strategy uh, where we're obliged, to, uh, well, the, the proposal is that, uh, that farmers would be expected to reduce their fertilizer use by 20, at least 20% 20 by 2030. Um, you know, how achievable is that, James? Um, and I suppose also in the context of the, the lead-in time that we spoke about earlier as well, that I think you mentioned a, a, a roughly four-year conversion process for farmers to, to really uh, be at a, an optimal level of, of use of clover in the system. I suppose really there is a sense of urgency here about this, isn't there? Yeah, I had a, a question there about that. that and um, really, with, with regard to the, the Green Deal, I've looked at some of the documentation and it's still not very clear. Uh, it's still, and I, I don't know if we've still seen the final version. 
and I, I, I don't know really about Green Deal targets. I think if we talk only about Irish targets, for example, like we talk about a 10 to 15 percent reduction by 2030, might sound like a massive target, but they're, we're actually increasing as we speak in terms of emissions from agriculture. Taking the, the easy approach and, and using, say, some of the different uh, things in the MAC document, we'll probably get down a few percentage points. I think when you look at the, the MAC doc document in its entirety, it, it, it does predict an increase if there's uh, increasing livestock numbers, and, and that's more or less what's happening. If you think about it in the context of what I've said, we can make some progress using protected urea, low emission slurry spreading. That might get us down maybe half of the way towards that target. I think to, to progress beyond that, we, we need to start thinking about clover. And that's not going to happen overnight. It's something that would need a lead in time, would need some sort of incentivization in terms of how to, how to bring it about. And then if we think about longer term in terms of if we still see some expansion on farms, we probably see displacement of beef cows by dairy cows and that kind of thing and how that will all work out. I think, um, you know, there, there are big challenges there and 10 years actually is a very short time frame when you start thinking about it in that, in that context. Uh, James, a, a very short and low, maybe heavily loaded question. What's stopping Salahed from going organic? <laughs> what, what, uh, well, I, um, the organic question is a good question. Yeah, it is, absolutely. And, and, and I think there, there, there are opportunities out there. I think small scale opportunities. I think we could run an organic system uh, very, we could. I, when we look at the experience in the University of Kiel, the, the farm that they're running, which is very similar to type of ideas that we're operating in Salahed, um, and they're doing it very well. So there's no need for Salahed to go organic. We can, we, can, we, can, uh, we can work with them and they're making good money out of it. You know, but it is, I, one, I, of the, I, it is I, one of the Green Deal uh, objectives is to, to have significant increases in, in, in organic. But there's a, I suppose it's, it's difficult enough in Ireland with the markets that, that, that we have. Yeah, and again, and, like I say, one of the big crops, if they, if they were to look at it um, from a technical point of view, I think there's a lot we can do. They would know better than about what market opportunities are out there. And kind of, so again, that, that's, that's, that's where that's at. I, like, um, we hear about growing markets internationally, particularly around infant formula. China, there were concerns about milk quality and organic, project, organic infant formula having a, having a strong market premium in, in, in China. Um, so I, I think it's there may be an opportunity there. Technically, I think we can we can run a, a good system. We're just out of, of time now, I'm afraid. Uh, James, thank you very much for an excellent presentation and uh, your very honest answers to to some some difficult questions there. Um, I want to thank uh, not only you, James, but Pat Murphy uh, for for uh, dealing with questions. Uh, and also our team, uh, Yvonne Maher and Andy Boland, who are uh, key uh, people in organizing this series. Um, next week, I'll be joined by Jenny Deakin, who uh, will be speaking about water quality. We're going to be shifting our focus over the month of June to, to looking at water quality and, and how agriculture can play its part in reducing uh, emissions to water quality. Uh, so Jenny will be talking about the River Basin Management Planning process uh, next Friday. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for listening. I uh, hope you have a great uh, June bank holiday weekend and stay safe at whatever you're doing. So thank you very much for tuning in today. Thank you.